Oh, yeah. I'm a member of. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at the uh, Lagoon Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. A nice fall morning. So, today we're talking about growing apples and pears. And pretty much what I'm telling you is going to be pertaining to Southern California, just so you know. Because then if you're in the Northwest or the Northeast, generally you do things a lot different than we do here. So we're, we're talking about apples and pears growing in a region with inadequate chill. So apples and pears do seem to have what is called a minimum chill requirement. which means that they need a certain amount of winter, and that's generally temperatures between 55 and 34 degrees. The, the flower buds on the plants have to be exposed to those temperatures for a certain number of hours before they bloom and produce fruit normally with warm weather. So if you don't get it, um, a lot of trees, especially stone fruits, just will not bloom, will not fruit well. Uh, Pears and apples have this, but a lot of them seem to be able to get around it. Where they, if they don't have the chill, they still produce. So it's kind of interesting in that, uh, you know, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, they'll tell you that, oh, we've got to get certain apples to pollinate certain apples. And we have to time, we have to put the right ones together. So they'll bloom at the same time because most apples in the right climate only bloom for about two weeks. Now in Southern California, or at least here, uh, Orange County, which is real mild weather, they don't bloom for two weeks. They bloom for about two months. If they can't figure out exactly when spring's starting because we didn't really have much winter. So they kind of slowly wake up, branch after branch starts to bloom, and they'll bloom for two months. So the pollination requirements for apples here isn't as strict because they bloom for such a long time that a lot of them overlap. Now there's a few exceptions, but most of the apples we grow overlap. And what's really interesting is about 10 years ago, the supplier, the Wilson Nursery, planted pretty much every apple they have in their catalog. And they probably have about 70, 80 apples in their catalog at the field station uh, about eight miles away from here in Irvine. Um, you know, no wind, you know, not much winter chill. And they said all but two apples in their catalog made good fruit, commercial quality fruit. So they were astounded too that, you know, they, they had to prove it to themselves because they were getting every time, you know, we were getting different apples for the last 20, 30 years and everyone we tried worked. You're going, okay, this is weird. That you know, red delicious. I tried that in the eighties and nineties, and it worked. And all the other apples that are supposed to need a thousand hours of chill were working. Well, back in the late eighties, early nineties, we saw an article in uh, in the California Rare Fruit Growers Journal saying that they grow apples in the Philippines and they grow Rome beauties, which need a thousand hours of chill. Well, the air in the Philippines where they were growing them gets zero hours of chill, it never drops below 55. They're growing in the mountains of, of the Philippines. And what they found, uh, all they had to do to grow apples there is after they would strip all the leaves off. And two weeks later, the trees would want to relief. And at the same time, any buds would open up and flower. And the fruit would take about, oh, four or five months to develop and ripen. And then when the fruit was harvested, they would strip them again. And the fact that they were stripping the mature leaves off their branches and the fruit are already finished, um, they can get it. They said they can get crop any time of year they want just by stripping the leaves off. Now, we can't do that exactly here. I mean, we can do it to an extent, but uh, they need, you know, apples do need, don't like it. 40 degrees at night, they don't develop well at 40 degrees at night. So we can't get, for most apples, we can't get that second crop in because, you know, it takes four or five months for each crop to ripe to develop. And if you do this after the first crop's off, you don't have enough time in the fall to get that second crop developed for most apples. There's 
Again, there are a few exceptions on that. So the apples seem to get away without the chill requirement. The pears seem to be able to do it to an extent. The problem with pears is that most of them ripen in the summer, whereas most apples ripen in the fall. So, you know, if you get a fall, an apple waking up quite late in the spring, they'll have the five months to develop in the fall before it gets too cold to develop. Whereas pears, most pears ripen in the summer. Uh, so my dad tried growing Bartlett pears, yeah, Bartlett pears uh, for 20 years. And he would get pears every year, they'd be about that thick because they'd wake up in June or July and make start and flower. But the ripening date is August. So, so they didn't have time to get any size. So we gave up on, on Bartlett's, the European pears, even though they would bloom and, and set fruit, they just wouldn't have time to develop properly. So there's a few pears that do well here, not many pears that have uh, lower chills. And sometimes, some years, the weather pattern that comes in can induce them to wake up early and we get them going. So, uh, so pear is a little more of a problem. Now, culturally on both, you know, if you leave a, a pear or apple to grow, they grow pretty big. They'll grow branches straight up, sometimes 15 foot straight up. The side branches will turn and go straight up. Uh, same height, uh, and then slowly they'll lay the weight of the branch will lay it outwards. When the branch lays outwards, then you know when they're going straight up like this, the only leaves that are getting full sun are the ones at the tips. So here you see the fruits forming on the tips of this branch because the, the top of the branch or the very end of the branch got enough sunlight. It's hard for them to develop fruit in here because it's too shady right here. But as this branch grows longer, it'll lay out from its own weight. And then that'll get this, some side shoots to start developing. And that's when you get these little short branches coming off those sides, uh, laying down shoots, they call them the fruiting spurs. So most of your crop on a, a mature tree is coming off fruiting spurs that grow off of these branches as they drop down. Now. We don't want to let them do their own thing anymore because to get to get this tree for the branches to lay down on their own, they may have to grow 15 foot tall and 20 foot across. Uh, so most orchards now just force them down. They'll take the little trees and when the stems are still pliable when they're growing, they will make them grow horizontally. And when you force a branch to grow horizontally, the tip stops growing. Any branch that's that's pointing upwards will can continue growing, but once it's laid down in the horizontal position, it won't will not grow this way any further. Especially if you make the tip go slightly downwards, it stops growing, and then all these buds start opening up, and you get your fruiting spurs growing. Now, sometimes they'll take off and make a, another vertical trunk. You just clip them. So if these take off and grow on you clip them down to about four to six inches. Just keep clipping, clipping, clipping all summer. And then the leaves that are, so generally what they, what most fruit trees do is in the, from September through December, whatever leaves get the most light, they'll make their flower buds right there. So if you keep clipping this side growth to keep it at this level, that's where the flower bud will be developing. They don't generally grow much past September. So if you clip it in September, You've got this branch that's two or three inches long. It'll develop a flower bud right there. So, training on peaches and apples, not necessarily the easiest way to do it, but ideally, you would have tiers of branches that are fairly horizontal, coming out front, back, left, right, every foot or so up the trunk is ideal. You'll have a a tier like Christmas tree, something like this. And a goal, if you want your tree to be the most productive, it can be per square foot in yards. So on farms, you're always talking about yeah, fruit per square foot. So in the old days, we let the trees grow, you know, we 
open them up and maybe go 20 foot wide with multiple upright trunks and lots of, this is called the old bay shape. This doesn't produce as much per square foot as a single trunk with the tiered structure of branches. So when you have, so let's say this is about five or six foot wide. The sun I can get in to the, all the way to the trunk in the middle at five to six foot wide. If it's 20 foot across, we've got a lot of dead area in here that's just too dark. That's the problem with the base shape, the old fashioned base shapes. I mean, this is simple. You don't have to prune as much. You don't have to train as much, but it is, but you don't get as much proof per square foot. So if you do it this way, five to six foot wide to eight foot tall, in somewhat of a Christmas tree form, then you'll get good production throughout the tree. And the nice thing about this, you can fit more apple trees on your lot or pear trees on your lot and get much more food production than you would with, you know, in the space of one big 15 foot wide tree, you can fit about nine of these. Well, not quite, uh, about four or five of these space, little space in between them. And something about this size, you can figure about a hundred fruits per year on something like that. A bigger tree, you've got about 300, 400 pieces of fruit. Um, but this way, if you keep them smaller, you'll have the nice thing about apples, especially apples, is that there's so many harvest periods available. So this is the Dave Wilson. If you get on the website, you'll see this, the ripening chart. And uh, it runs from May through December. And the apples start ripening, the earliest apples start ripening in June. And at least in the Central Valley where Dave Wilson is, the last apples are picked by mid-November. Now, in Southern California, this tails off into well into December. Because our apples wake up, a lot of our apples wake up a little late and they won't ripen a lot of the major ones till December. And they and a lot of the late ripening apples have a good hang time on top of that. They'll hang two months right without deterioration. We're talking February. So June through February. And there and there is one or two apples that don't pay attention to seasons too well. We'll talk about those that uh, uh, you, you'll find that you get apples any month of the year. So this is one way, one of the ways you like to train them. Uh, pears, about the same way, essentially. They're a little harder, they're a little stiffer than the apple. This is a pear tree, a little stiffer. When apples are, are, are young, they're very rubbery, branched. Pear tree's a little bit stiffer. To get branches to um, grow sideways, we do often do what they call a Dutch cut, cut to a bud on the bottom of the branch, and the buds on the bottom of the branches tend to go this way, buds on the top of the branches tend to go inwards. So you, if you have a problem like this branch is too stiff to get it down again, cut it to this bud on the outside, you'll get a branch coming out like this, and as it comes out, just kind of train it downwards. Well, you cut right above the bud on the bottom. So if I want this this growth that this bud to sprout out and grow this way, you cut down to this bud just above it, and this bud will sprout out, go this direction. You cut to the bud on the inside, then it of course goes that direction. So did you cut that one like that? Really, um, like uh, this one's still pliable. If I pull this down, we, we left this like this only because in the nursery we don't have enough room to let them spread out. But it's still probably, if I tie this down or put a weight on it, it'll, it'll lower. I mean, those fruit tree branches, you know, you don't want to force them, they'll break. 
but you'll notice on your fruit tree if you if you have heavy fruit on this branch it slowly just lowers you know i mean most branches on most fruit trees after years and years they just go like that from the way of the fruit on them okay um i should mention so this is a bare root pear tree from last year you didn't make it someone left in the bag too long so uh, the, the roots were dried up before they planted anyway so this is how they come now apples are a little easier than pears the apple the roots are very fibrous and uh, you know they've been they're grafted here this is rootstock the original soil level is about here on apples you know you can plant it anywhere from here to here you're fine i mean they're they're real easy going trees they don't you don't have to be as accurate but this was the original soil level on pear trees they don't have very fibrous roots and they tend to lose a lot of moisture at the roots so the main thing you do not want to do is leave it too high in the ground and uh, one of our other suppliers would always say bury the, the graph just to make sure it's it's buried so that they don't dry up if you you know if you leave any root exposed the roots can sunburn they can dry up so they they want us to plant the pears deep and that's fine uh pear roots and apple roots are the least likely of all tree roots to suffocate from being planted to you they're very, very tolerant of low oxygen levels, uh, whereas persimmons are not, um, the cherries are not, but apples are very, and pears especially, pears number one, very resistant to suffocation from planting too deep. So it's better to plant them deep, all the way to the bud, you know. And if you want your tears to start low, and if they don't have any, or you want them to start, say if you want the branches to start here then when you plant it it's nice to cut it right to here and then the top three or four buds will start growing most of them you let you force them sideways one you let go straight up again and then three or four months later you cut the top of that branch off and get it to tear out again say about a foot higher let it grow, you know, two or three foot, then cut it down to one foot above the lowest tier, then you get it to do it again. I mean, if you're in Canada, this takes four or five years to make these tiers because they, they only have three months of growing season here. But here, every three months, if you want to cut that branch and make another tier, uh, you can do that. The pear trees, this is typical how they come in. Our apple trees come in, a lot of them come in looking like this. A lot of them have a lot of branching. Uh, the tiers may not be even. You might yes. have a few branches off to make it more even. And in apples and pears, a lot of times, if you would only have branches on one side of the tree, we've seen where the growers on the farms have just, you know, the apples, again, are so pliable. They take the branch on one side, and they'll just curve it all the time to the other side. So that it, it it fits in that spot where there's not no other branch. So, you know, structure is not that important if it's not a perfect structure, but you want to fill in all the gaps and make sure there's branches wherever there's sunlight coming in to take advantage of the space. And both apples and pears are among, well, I think apples rated number one as the best healing tree of known. In other words, if you cut off, and pears are close to that, so you cut them anywhere, they'll heal right there. They'll seal that wound right where you cut it. Whereas their relatives, the stone fruit family, are about the worst healing trees in nature. So if you cut a peach tree too much, if you make wounds all over a peach trunk, you're going to kill that trunk. Apple, you can really scar this thing up. It, it heals really well. <laughs> like peach orchards modern peach orchards 12 13 years is their average lifespan of the orchard apple orchards 150 years is not unusual so they can keep on going keep on going um, can you explain about doing one apple tree 
Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, well, we have we have some coming, so we'll, we'll talk. Okay. So, um, so when you plant them, generally in the ground, you don't add any planter mix at all. They don't the planter mix is not the right stuff anyway. So you just make a hole in the ground, drop them in. Apple compares don't care what kind of soil you have as long as it's moist. So it could be clay, could be sand, could be gravel. As long as you keep them moist, they're they're good to go. Fertilizer wise, the first year, uh, orchards they don't do it. Um, they just let the tree root in, get the roots going good. Though you'll get a maybe two foot of growth without any fertilizer before they slow down. Um, we like to see them grow a little more net, so we'll throw on a couple handfuls of something organic in general. And both of these do well in containers. Uh, pears may be a little better than apples. Apples don't like the heat generated by the black plastic anyway, but if you any other kind of container, they do quite well. And we usually would use our top pot potting stool to grow them in. And that's a good permanent soil. Most potting soils uh, are made out of the ground up wood. And because of that, they shrink over time and uh, uh, the roots aren't as happy in it because everything in there is rotting, whereas uh, nothing in our mix uh, rots much at all. We don't like rotting soil, not the best thing in the world. <clears throat> the one problem, the big problem with apple compares is they are subject to a disease called fire blight. <laughs> so that's a bacterial infection brought by bees. We need bees to do pollination. <clears throat> There's no bees, you're not going to get much fruit. So fortunately, apple flowers and pear flowers are very attractive to bees, so the bees come pretty readily. <clears throat> but the bees can carry this bacteria infection with them. It's a very ingenious, well, not ingenious, but unfortunately, the disease um, evolved to attract bees. So even if you saw a fire blight infected branch on a pear tree, and pears are always going to get fire blight, it seems, the branch this time of year would look black and scorched and dead. <clears throat> But the winter rains will activate the fungus that's in this branch and it'll start oozing an amber liquid filled with its spores, the bacterial spores. And the bees see this and they think, well, let's, let's investigate this. It looks like honey. So they'll land on it, pick up the spores, and then go visit the apple or pear flower and transmit the disease right into the flower. Uh, and that reinfects the tree. And when Fire blight gets in a branch, kills the circulation on that branch. It can travel up and down the stem and wipe out, you know, a young tree, you can wipe out the entire tree if it's real bad. Uh, older trees, generally it wipes out that one branch and that's, <clears throat> and then you have a infected branch you've got to clip out. Now you do have to be careful when you clip out branches that do have fire blight, you've got to clean your pruners with, uh, say, 10% bleach uh, between prunings is you'll infect the whole tree if you keep cutting into it. So fire blight is a major problem. Um, there's one product we sell. So in orchards, they often use antibiotics since it's a bacterial infection. Uh, homeowners really aren't allowed to use to buy and purchase antibiotics. <clears throat> we have a product called uh, Garden Floss. Which is quite quite effective. Um, in most states of the U.S., this is not considered a chemical. It's mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. It almost sounds like one ingredient in Diet Coke. And Coke, uh, I think they have phosphoric acid in there. <clears throat> but it is a. In many states, it's registered as a fertilizer because it's potassium and phosphorus. Phosphorus being the effect the um, ingredient that actually works. So they found out if they can really increase the phosphorus level in the plant system, uh, that helps fight off diseases. And it, and it does work pretty well. So what they have you do is be right before it blooms, 
you take the garden spot boss and just spray you know the tree's still dormant but the buds are trying to swell you spray the trunk and branches pretty heavy dose it'll be about 50 percent this and 50 percent water it just spritz the branches in the trunk and that'll protect the flowers as they open up so once it leaves out there's a different form that you spray the foliage with the uh, half phosphorus will burn these leaves off if it's too strong and you don't have to mix water with it just half this and half water oh, half water these are lap. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> you see these people sitting in chairs and he gets excited. <laughs> so if you apply this, uh, and then what, if you if you don't apply and you see the fire blight, you can apply still apply this to help stop the fire blight from spreading. <laughs> so pear trees usually die from fire blight eventually. Apple trees may not. Some apples are very resistant. Most pear trees aren't that resistant. When they do get fur blight, they turn this kind of this black color like this. This died from something else, but you see branches on your tree that look real black. That is usually uh, fire blight caused. And in fact, one other way to control it is you just watch the flowers as they bloom. And um, if the flower is healthy, as the white petals age, they'll just turn tan and that's fine. If the white flower petals turn gray or black, you know it's it's infected. You just snap that whole thing right off. Sometimes you snap the whole cluster. They usually make a cluster of between three to seven or even nine flowers. And if that thing's turning black, you can snap that whole cluster off and get rid of the report. It's like gangrene it goes from the flowers to the stems to the trunk. You can snap it off before it gets down the branch and control it that way. Now you may be able to grow apples and pears for decades without ever seeing fire blight. It's just if it's in your neighborhood. So I grew apples and pears for probably 10, 15 years before I saw it. So we of course this is back in the 80s and 90s and before then, we didn't really grow apples and pears much in the area because we didn't think they would grow here. So uh, there wasn't much fire blight around. Now that a lot of people have more people have apples and pears, it's more common now. That's the main disease they get. They can get um, aphids on the new growth. We usually don't treat that. If you're really worried about that organic crop like bond name, it on the heap, it's on the ends of the branches will control that. Um, sometimes we get mildew on the new growth. If it's really overcast, the neem oil will also take care of that pretty well. Uh, now, as far as pollination goes, uh, all orchards use it. Homeowners, we don't think it's essential. We've seen most of the non Fertile apples produce fruit without pollination partners and pears also. Um, but if you don't have a pollen, so like there's two apples that I used to grow, Anna and Dorset, and they and they bloom together. I liked the Anna, didn't like the Dorset. So I just pulled the Dorset out because I didn't think it was as good as the Anna. Without its pollination partner, the Anna made well, oh, maybe 90% of the apples that it usually made, but a lot of them are flat-sided because they were missing some seeds. So if you have the pollination part, or you have all the seeds in the fruit, and the fruit is, is symmetrical and larger, if you don't have a pollinator, you may only have, like some of the fruit I opened up only had one seed. So they were not pollinated fully from their own pollen. They are better if they had the pollination partner they like some other, you know, uh, genetically different pollen better. So they have a full complement of five or six seeds, and then the, the fruit would be larger and better shaped. But still, we got good fruit without, the, and I didn't, you know, I didn't bother to replant the pollination part because the and it was good enough for me. And pear trees seem to be the same way. They seem to produce fruit by themselves. Uh, perhaps a little better fruit if you have that pollination part. We're not, you know, we haven't grown all the pears. We don't know 
if all the pears have produced fruit without a pollination partner, but so far every pear I've grown uh, without a partner has made fruit. Although, truthfully, when they were young. So I used to grow hood pears along with Florida home pear. The Florida home pear died after five years. The hood pear sulked for two years, didn't make a single fruit for two years. I said, okay, we got to get that Florida home back next to this hood pear. But three years later, it started making hundreds of pears all by itself. So we're going, okay, it apparently doesn't need it. Either that or, you know, some of the ornamental pear trees there were providing the pollen. Okay, um, we do get in, so one other thing we do get in, we do get in uh, different forms of apples, pear trees, no, but apple trees. We do get in what are called espaliers. So on these apple trees, the grower, they do this in a greenhouse. So this is, you know, it's kind of cheating. <laughs> so they take a rootstock called M7. They grow a tree of that, and then they graft onto it branches at the levels they want to. So at one foot, two foot, three foot in height, they graft on branches on this to make an espalier tree. So we get these in, uh, it's about six foot across already, three and a half foot, four foot tall. So they're kind of short. Um, good for container height, but kind of short in the ground. And then you can see that the tips are pointed up so they would continue growing. So you can lay them down, they won't grow anymore, and they'll start making their side branches. And then you'll have an apple go along, you know, can pass this to a fence or to wires, and you'll have a flat structure. This is a common way, not the way orchards do it. They, they will train them from a single trunk, but it's a common method of growing apples now. It's on on uh, fences or long wires you know, on a farm. I think one of the problems we have with apples, fruit's so big, the branches are fairly thin. If you have too many apples growing on a branch, it, that branch is hanging straight down. So they support these wires to keep them in the same location. So you can't ever form one of those from a regular tree? Oh, you can certainly do it. Okay, so we have, we have, Right, we had another grower who was doing the same form, but they were, you know, they spent an extra year training the branches. So, you, so on this, from this grower, we saw branches doing this. They would have branches going like that because <laughs> they didn't have the branch in the right spot. So they would just take the branches and turn them <clears throat> to go the right directions. <clears throat> this is more the classic way of doing it. There's a company back east that does pears a real neat way. They roll pear trees like this. <laughs> and sell them that way. That's got to take some time to do that, a couple of years. That's kind of a real, I mean, it's not real effect efficient, but it looks really nice on the wall. <laughs> And then she was mentioning we do have some multi grafted apple trees coming. Um, one of the problems with them is usually the apple tree that they use to graft the other branches to has got to be either golden delicious or something related because golden delicious uh, takes all the grafts better. So they'll have a tree that's primarily. Golden Delicious, or in our case, Dorset Golden, which is a daughter of Golden Delicious, and then they'll graft other branches onto it. And one of the issues is that they'll graft at least three other things onto this, but not all of them take. So they're, you know, so it's, they graft, essentially it's four apple trees that they create, four different varieties. But usually only three of them take. And the problem we have is we don't know what we're going to get. So this year, the one we ordered is Anna Dorset Golden, which is the main tree, uh, Fuji, and Gala. 
And unfortunately, out of those four, the one least likely to take, Fuji. And that's the one people always want. They want the Fuji in this group. If there's not a Fuji there, they probably won't buy it. And that's the problem. Fuji, when you have a multi-graph tree, Fuji's always the, last, the slowest one to take off. For some reason, Fuji is just slow. In my yard, Fuji was the slowest to grow, the last one to make fruit. Um, but it's one of the most desired apples we have. So when you have a multi-grafted one with these four on it, Often Fuji is missing. It's the one that just didn't take. So. Does that mean that mm -hmm. in a single tree, if they take it, you're going to get banana, apple, and also apple. That's the well, then you'll get because that's the main tree. Okay. And you'll hopefully get <clears throat> two other ones beside that. Isn't that, uh, for example, if I get a banana tree, you got to get another dosa tree in order for them to cross? No, I pulled mine in. Huh? Really? Dorsa and Anna, I pulled the dorsa out. I didn't like it. And Anna's still producing. Mm -hmm. so not, you don't have to get two apple trees. Mm -hmm. Not that we've seen. Now, commercially, if you want to grow commercial apples, yes, you need that because they're prettier apples when you pollinate them. They're more round and symmetrical. If you don't pollinate them, they're sometimes lopsided or sometimes a little smaller. Oh. But they still make, and we still make, see them making plenty of apples mm -hmm. without pollinators. Mm -hmm. And we think pears are probably the same way. Although, you know, especially when they're young, when my pear tree was younger, it made more better, it made a better crop. I made a crop when I had the pollinator, didn't make it when I, when the pollinator died. However, eventually it was producing hundreds of apple, apple uh, pears all by itself. Yeah. So, <clears throat> So here in California, you don't need two trees. You can just plant one first. Yeah, we don't really usually worry about the pollination on them. Oh. But if you want the best apples you can get, <clears throat> get two. Okay. So let's <clears throat> go over some of the varieties. Uh, we'll start with apples in the order of the order they wake up and the order they produce fruit. Um, the Dorset Golden is and its polished part. Now, this apple is actually decent if you live further inland. The Dorset Golden is kind of a yellow green apple. It's related to Golden Delicious. It was a seedling that was spit out. Or a seed that was spit out, and you know, somebody ate a golden delicious in the Bahamas and spit the seeds out. And up comes this tree in the Bahamas and it makes fruit. So it doesn't need any chill. Um, it often wakes up January or February and it produces fruit in June. So my in, my father in law lived in Hemet and he grew this and it was good there because in June it's already 90 degrees in Hemet. Uh, mm -hmm. Here it's June. It can be if it's really cloudy and cool. It doesn't. Yeah, it's tart. It doesn't sweeten up. But say if you mm -hmm. live in Fullerton, or especially if you live in Riverside or Chino, you know Chino, uh, it's going to be a better flavor. So a lot of areas, this is a real good apple. Close to the coast, it, it's probably not. So. And then we have Anna. And Anna's from Israel. I do like this apple a lot. Now, the early apples like Dorset and Anna, and Einschmier is another one we don't carry because it's similar to Dorset. Einschmier is also from Israel. Um, this ripens July. The, one of the disadvantages of the early apples is that they don't have good hang time, they don't have good shelf life. So, Anna apple which kind of resembles a golden bush. It's a real tall barrel-shaped apple. It's big too. Um, it's got a mild sweet flavor with just a hint of acidity to give it some interest. I would tell you it's probably the closest, if you like honey crisps, this might be the closest thing you can get uh, to that. You know, mild, sweet, crispy, tender texture. But the early apples like these two have a short hang time, a short shelf life. 
So, which means that you leave this apple on the tree more than a couple weeks after it's ripe, it's mushy. And after mm -hmm. you pick it, you leave it on your countertop for more than a couple of days, it's mushy. So you've got to eat it right away, or you have to put it in a refrigerator in a Ziploc bag. You put this apple in a Ziploc bag, sealing out the extra oxygen. Especially if you squeeze out the oxygen after you seal it, it'll last two months in, in the refrigerator. But on the tree, you know, maybe two weeks on the tree before it gets mushy, only a couple of days on the countertop once you pick it. Same thing with Doris of Gold. So they don't have good hang time or good shelf life. However, both of these have time to make that second crop. So main crop, June, July, second crop, November, December. And both of these, especially Anna, a lot of our customers have Anna said, you get apples any month of the year. You don't get a lot of apples every month of the year, but the tree doesn't doesn't seem to be able to figure out what month it is. <laughs> so it keeps blooming all the time and you just keep getting apples. So the main season is brand is July, but you often get apples just constantly on that one. And they're good. I like those apples. My tree blooms and blooms and blooms too much. I'm kind of coordinating the spring. Well, you just hit the trunk with the garden floss every once in a while. Or you can dilute it according to when the plants have foliage on them. It's great any time. Right. You also treat the worms too. So. Good, good point. So with worms, um, the main time you only get worms is if there's two apples in a cluster like, you know, this is a pear. Pears have the same worms. So there is there is a bug called coddling moth. And it goes into the apples and pears that ripen in the summer and early fall. Um, these two don't get any worms if they ripen in, the, in late winter, I mean, late spring, early summer. They don't seem to get any worms. It's the apples that start ripening in August. September, October, they get worms, and the pears that ripen in July and August get worms. But they generally don't get worms if they're hanging singly. So if you have two apples touching, you know, you have a cluster and you don't thin it out. Well, usually when the apples are and pears are about this big, you cut off all but one in the cluster so that they'll develop properly and make sure that they're not, if you have more than one cluster close together, you just take the entire other cluster off. So you don't want any apples touching like this because the coddling moth has to hide the eggs and they usually hide them where two apples touch or where an apple or a fruit, a pear touches the branch, they'll hide the egg there. So you make sure your fruit's hanging cleanly and you rarely get worms in those fruit. Rarely, I mean, I would say Johnny Gold then uh, my house, John Gold was the exception, and so was uh, Mutsu apple. They were the huge apples, seem to get worms even. Sometimes it's, they're so big, they touch something, the leaf, something, and they'll get worms in them. But most of the other apples, if they, if we culled them or picked off and thinned them out so there was only one per cluster, no worms. Now, one other thing that happens to apples sometimes well, it does happen. So we're finding that if apples don't get the chill they like, they don't have a long fruit stem. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, I haven't seen that enough to tell you it's true. But it seems like if apples don't get the chill they require, the fruit is stuck to the branch like this, and sometimes you get worms in there because it's so close. Because we found that if we had a cooler winter, the stems on our Fuji apple tree would be one or two inches long. If we had, didn't have a winter, the fruit would be stuck to the branch. And it's kind of weird that, that that happened. I don't know if it's true or not. I haven't read it in the literature that cold winters make longer fruit stems, but it sure seemed to in my yard that if we didn't have a cold winter, the fruit was stuck to the branches like this and you had more tents and get worms in there. So to control worms, if you don't want to, so another way to control worms, you put a bag around this. Um, UC Davis said uh, for the organic orchards, um, if you take a um, paper bag, number two paper bag, smart vinyl iris, 
punch a hole in the bottom of it, slip it over the apple when the apple was about the size of a golf ball and roll up the other end will develop totally within that bag without any bugs or diseases affecting the apple. So a uh, bit of work, unless you know, unless you make more money off, unless you really like apples. Um, there is a spray too, I should mention that. Uh, chemicals contain spinosad, which is considered an organic chemical. It's found in rum. You spray it on the apple. You have to spray them every two weeks. From the time they're about the size of a golf ball, the last two weeks on the fruit. In that in that time, no worm can can really touch the fruit. So it's down. And generally, this is and you can spray this up to the week before you harvest. So the common moth is a thing that's in the blossom. On the on the skin somewhere, right? And generally, where two apples touch, you always see where two apples touch. There's a hole in each of them where they touch. Is there another type of one? Apple maggots, but I haven't seen those. Yeah. Which one's inside the fruit and burrows out? That seems to be what I have. The colony moths. Start on the skin and work the way in. I mean, on peaches, there's two other worms. But uh, apples, so I've just seen. Now, there are, you can get uh, common moth traps that will trap the adult moths, well, it traps the male moths. Um, and there's other ways to treat. I mean, this is not apple country, so. We just don't have that many of them around. If you're an apple orchard, they would do multiple things to control the coughing mob. Okay, so Dorset, Anna. And then the next one to ripen is Gala in August. So this is the later season apple. It usually blooms, unfortunately, it blooms late. So Galas here don't have time to get any size. So galas, you know, if you're in Oregon, Washington, or you go to a supermarket, you see gala apples this big. Here, because they wake up late and ripen early, they are only medium size. That's that's about as good as you can do unless we have a really cool winter. The galas don't have time to get the full size here, but they still taste like a gala apple. They look like gala apple. Now, just so you know, we've tried to grow honey crisp for ages. Um, and if you want to grow honey crisp, it ripens in uh, August also. So the honey crisp apple trees, we we grew them for about ten years. The biggest fruit we got on them, all in the coldest winter we'd ever seen, which was two thousand eight. The apples were that big, about the size of apricots. Generally, with honey crisp are the size of cherries, they still taste like honey crisp. But honey crisp got a real high minimum show requirement, you know, well over a thousand hours. So this thing doesn't wake up. Typically, this will wake up and start blooming in July, mid-July. <laughs> it has four weeks to ripen. It just doesn't have time. So they get about the size of cherries. They taste like honey crisp, but Gala will wake up early if it's got a lower chill. Gala's from New Zealand. The so lower chill factor, they wake up a bit earlier than honey crisps and they'll get, get decent. And then uh, one of the better apples is Donegal in September. That's a big apple. Um, now, apples. One of the ways to make sure they have the best quality fruit is when they ripen, the month before they ripen, if the temperature does not stay right at 90, 95 degrees, they're better quality. They say if it's really hot the month before they ripen, they're not as good. Now, generally, you know, we're not like Riverside. Orange County averages in the 80s. Some summers, if we get a real hot summer, Donegal may not come out as good as it can if it's the summer is really nasty. But 
generally they would have more of a trouble with this one in Riverside than we would here. And I have a couple customers in Huntington Beach that say this is the best apple they've ever grown. They just love it in Huntington Beach. Of course, that's almost the perfect climate for apples around here would be Huntington Beach. Especially if you live anywhere near the end of the Santa Ana River. The Santa Ana River gives you a lot more chill than you would if you were anywhere else in Orange County. All the riverbeds stay cold. Is there the lowest places in Orange County in the cold area that's out of there? Uh, the Johnny Gold, uh, really good along the coast. Then next would be, uh, my list down makes I'm not missing any. Well, there's, um, well, Fuji is pretty much next. Now, we get the original Fuji. This is uh, October. There is a red Fuji that sold the supermarkets a little more. The taste tests they've done with apples say that generally the greener the skin, the better flavor it has. And generally, the redder the skin, the more bland it is. So if you like them bland, you get red Fuji. If you like them a little more flavorful, you get the original green Fuji, which so we carry the original green. I've ordered the red one too, but I'm not confirmed that I'm getting any. I might get some, but at the moment, we just gained the original, which is the better flavor. Now, Fuji is one that very little, quote, acids in it in the first place. So it's generally the sweet. When Fuji first came out in the 80s, they were wonderful at the supermarket. And then in the late 80s, they said the farmers got greedy. They started letting the trees make too much fruit. So in the late 80s, we know, boy, the Fuji at this store, they have no taste. So the University of California, Davis, or I'm not sure if it was, yeah, I think it was California. They told the farmers they have to be a little bit better at growing Fuji. So if you let too many apples form on the branch, None of them have any flavor at all. So they actually did a study to find out how many fruit they can have on the tree to make a decent quality fruit. And they you know, they told the farmers one apple for every 27 leaves. So they actually count the leaves on the tree to see how much fruit the food you can really hold. And they said, yeah, 27 leaves per fruit, you'll get good tasting Fuji apples. Otherwise, they won't have any taste at all. The food is October. And then uh, we have a pink pearl. We, we haven't seen this enough to tell exactly when it ripens, but we think it's October is the main month. Pink pearl is a novelty apple. It's a little bit more tart than most apples, but it's still good. The thing about pink pearl is the flesh is pink. Not white like most apples are, it's pink inside. The outside is kind of a pearly, pinkish, greenish, yellowish color. And the inside is this dark pink. So it's more of a novelty, uh, but we do sell them. Then we have the late apples coming next. And all the late apples seem to ripen real late. So we have um, so this is Arkansas black. And we have uh, Granny Smith. I put down wine sap also, wine sap. Um, pink lady. And sundowner. So you can figure all these apples ripen in late November into December into January and February. So if you're in Oregon, all these ripen mid fall. But here, because they wake up late, they all ripen really late. But it's great because the late ripening apples, no worms. Too late for the worms. The weather's cool, so they don't have any problem with the heat. And they turn out really good. The late apples for us turn out really good. Um, 
So Granny Smith is picked in or in Oregon. It's picked in October. Here we pick it in December. It'll hang on the tree till March. The interesting thing about Granny Smith. Now these three apples are from Australia. Australia really doesn't have any chill there, which is kind of weird. Granny Smith is from Sydney. Sydney is the same latitude as Mazatlan, Mexico. So they said in Australia, the Granny Smith apples go next to pineapples. I mean, I was I was thinking maybe Granny Smith was on a mountain near Sydney that you know explained where you can grow apples there. But I looked it up; it's just a suburb of Sydney at sea level. So that's that's really unusual. So Granny Smith. Now we think in Australia it's not green because here. If you leave it on the tree till you know, Christmas, it's yellow and it's really sweet. And it's also by January, it's super fragrant. It's a totally different apple than it is in November when it's green and tart. But by Christmas, so I think in Australia, it's probably a yellow, sweet, fragrant apple like it is here at Christmas time. I mean, my neighbor had a Granny Smith and I could smell it from my front yard when it was ripe in January. It was just, an amazing apple. So, uh, Granny Smith has some good things going for it. I don't like them green. I do like them yellow. They're extremely resistant to fire blight because my neighbor never treated his for fire blight <laughs> and it would never catch it. It is susceptible to mildew, powder mildew on the leaves. Not a big deal. Uh, they usually outgrow it. So, Granny Smith, um, Real long hang time. I mean, Fuji has the longest hang time known, and you can keep a Fuji in the refrigerator for 18 months <clears throat> in, you know, in a Ziploc bag. Granny Smith, nine months in a Ziploc bag. So they store really well too. Pink Lady and Sundowner. Um, unfortunately, they changed the names. I wish they left the original name in Australia. Uh, Crips Pink. Mr. Cripps, I guess, uh, Mr. Cripp, about the Cripp bread. This sounds like some kind of Alzheimer situation with the sundowner. <clears throat> so they gave it a terrible name here. Um, of the apples we've grown, this one is my favorite, the sundowner. In Australia, it is the number one selling apple as Cripps Red. Um, the reason they brought Pink Lady over and promoted it more is because it's very distinctive looking. It's got that rosy pink greenish color to it. Sundowner does look like a red Fuji, so it's not as distinctive looking. But if you know Pink Lady apples, you know, Granny Smith to me, when it's green, it's too firm and it's too uh, tart. And then Pink Lady, not quite as firm, not quite as tart, but still quite firm and quite tart. Sundowner, a little less firm, still crispy, and not quite as tart as Pink Lady. I like the Sundowner. I think that's, the per for me at least, the perfect uh, balance between sweet and tart. And a lot of people think Pink Lady is, a, is really good because it's got that real powerful tartness to it, but it's got enough sweetness to overcome it. The Sundowner is just a little bit more mild than Pink Lady. They're both excellent. Arkansas black, a lot of people love this apple. We like it too. And then wine sap's another one. Oops, one in the sap. <laughs> and a lot of the late apples are all good storage apples. All good. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting about the United States is <clears throat> 150 years ago, Apples was the most important crop that the farmers had. Because in those days, <clears throat> they didn't have you know, water districts with water that was healthy to drink. And so a lot of times, the only thing that was good to drink was apple cider. So everybody had their apple trees. They made a whole bunch of apple cider because they can store it. And it was healthy to drink. Whereas <clears throat> you take water out of the river, you don't know how good that water is. So they said all the, uh, you know, all the settlements and 
in Europe. You know, apples originated uh, kind of Central Asia um, near the Caucasus Mountains. <clears throat> so everyone in Europe grew apples for cider. And when they came to the United States, everybody grew apples for cider, just so they would have something safe to drink. So up until the uh, 1900s, <clears throat> apples were the number one crop. And most of the apples they had those times were so uh, tart and so firm that you have to pick them in the fall, keep them in your cellar or in your barn for months and months before until they were ripe and edible. So we don't grow those apples anymore. We grow the apples that you can eat off the tree. I mean, I grew mutsu, which was, which is one of the most, uh, well, it's an awesome apple. They're, they average about grapefruits and nice. Mutsu apples are crazy, but the problem with mutsu, and um, in the United States, it's called Christian. And it's called mutsu. But you can't eat that up off the tree. You gotta let it sit in a bag on your counter for at least a month before it's soft enough to eat. That thing is just so firm. The moose is a great storage apple. Uh, um, they claimed it had the best flavor, so that's why I grew it. But you you know, you gotta wait. You gotta wait. <laughs> you gotta wait. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's also a monster tree, so we just quit caring because it was a monster tree with monster fruit. Uh, that you couldn't eat right off the tree, so we kind of gave up on that one. But most apples, where I grew, I've grown red delicious. They turn out fine. Um, so most apples will grow. If you have any favorites that you want us to carry, that you like, one person yesterday just came up and told me, "Well, if you can have a chance to get ash mead kernel, they had some at a farmer's market. They love ash mead kernel." So if our supplier has those available this winter, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up a few and see how well they do in this area. <clears throat> and again, the four and one we're getting are three and one out. Yeah, it's a three and one, uh, Dorset Anna, uh, Fuji, and Gala. <clears throat> And the Espaliard apples, we're getting Anna, Gala, and Fuji as the Espaliards. Oh, I didn't mention that. Uh, apples like it really wet. So that's the one downfall with apples. Now, um, we're getting them on a, most of them on M111 rootstock and M7, which are not too sensitive. Like in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Northern California, they grow apples on different rootstocks that keep them small. They said the problem with those rootstocks that keep them really small, like seven, eight foot, is that they need way more water than the semi-dwarf rootstocks use need. So we're, we're getting the semi-dwarf. Um, there are standard rootstocks on apples that make the tree a little more drought resistant, but those apple trees want to grow for five years before they fruit, so we don't get those. We want to have something reasonable. So we get them on semi-dwarf rootstock, M111, M7 from Eng their English rootstocks, and they'll keep the trees, say, 10 to 15 foot tall. But, you know, again, we like to keep pruned at about six to eight foot, where you can, where you can reach the fruit. You get, they're easy to prune, uh, which not so hard. The, um, but yeah, there are some dwarf rootstocks that dwarf them further, but you've got to always have them well staked. They can't stand up and they need lots of water. Okay, I think I covered it on the apples. So pears, there aren't many pears that do well here. So there's European and there's Asian pears. The Asian pears that we usually sell are the ones from Japan. And they originated in China, but in Japan they 
develop some of the more unique varieties. Uh, European pears are things like Barlet de Anjou, Thomas, Comis, or whatever that, or that's pronounced. But those, we've tried them, they just don't make big pears here. Um, I had, I grew Comis or Thomas, which is supposed to be the best of the European pears. Like 20 years, I got one crop. So it wasn't worth it, although a lot of literature says it does well here. I just haven't seen it, so I'm not pushing European pears. Now, what they did is they, when they crossed European and Asian pears, they got a group of pears that had, for some reason, needed less chill. So the first one out back in the 70s was called Orient. We tried it and made fruit. They weren't very good at all, so we gave up on that one right away. But they kept on making new crosses. So what they did is they took these original crosses and recrossed them with European pears and got so these other pairs, these other hybrids are three quarters European, one quarter Asian. And the one we're still carrying is called Keeper. And that one, shaped like European, pretty much like the European pair. Um, it's good, it's not wonderful. So if you like, really like European pairs, Keeper might be the best one, but we've got two others that were Checking out Southern Southern King Nintendo Tui. Now Nintendo Tui is across is across between a European pair called Tennessee and one of the Japanese pairs called Hotui. So we're carrying two Japanese pairs, twentieth century. And it's funny that some of the fruit catalogs list a 20th century pair and a, another pair called Niji Seiki. And in Japanese, Niji Seiki means 20th century. They have two pair trees. <laughs> oh, well. <clears throat> we don't carry that one. We also have one called Hoopsui, which is the top rated Japanese pair. And Tendo Sui is half Hosui and half uh, European. And the nice thing that happened this year was we had some of the two of these trees in the nursery that were a couple years old. This is one of them. This is the Hosui. They both sat a good crop. We're, we're just amazed. We hadn't seen Asian pears produce a good crop for a long, long time. I mean, last time I grew an Asian pear was back in the 80s. And I had dabbled them now and then, never saw them make fruit. And suddenly this year, our Hosui, this thing had 10 beautiful, full size Hosui pears on it. They were just, to me, Asian pears are really, well, to Asian people, Asian pears are really good. Uh, Ten Hosui resembled European pears more. Same color, kind of a light brown. Uh, Hosui shaped like this antenna suey shaped like this similar flavor but this had the typical japanese pear texture so crispy but extremely tender to me it was almost like he always and very juicy so it's always i i described by it like eating crushed ice <laughs> very tender extremely juicy uh, maybe only two thirds as sweet as a European pear. <clears throat> so the sweetness, say, of watermelon, is to, to a lot of Asian people, European pear is just too sweet. This too, they call it cloyingly sweet, just too sweet. The Asian pears, to a lot of Asian people, just perfect sweetness. It's very light textured, crispy, tender. I mean, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Old suey pear and ten of suey right next to it. A uh, simmer crop ripened a little bit later than hope suey. Uh, very good. Most of my employees like this a little better. But I like this one a lot. So we're really jazzed that both of those produced really well this year. And they're and they made good pollination partners. They bloomed at the same time. So if you want the best quality pears, 
that's a good pair we think that'll grow in this area. The winter we just had was a little cooler than we've had the last 10 years. Um, not as cold as we had 20 years ago. So, uh, and this year we seem to be on a, well, they said this year is going to be cool. So, um, we'll see what happens with this year. I mean, right now we're actually getting chill. <laughs> we're actually already getting chill. Oh, I didn't mention, uh, if on the apple trees, if by March they haven't dropped their leaves yet, because the pear, the pears usually drop their leaves in December. Very uniformly drop their leaves. Apple trees sometimes hang on to their leaves, especially the, not the early apples, but the late apples. And if their leaves are still on them around March, then you just kind of run your hands down the branches and then the leaves just snap off as you do that. Just take the leaves off because the leaves kind of, the chemicals that the leaves may kind of inhibit the flower buds from opening up. So if you like what they do in the Philippines, they just strip all the leaves off two weeks before they want them to bloom. So here, strip the leaves off by, you know, I would say leave the leaves on till through March, just because they're making more energy for the plant. More energy, better fruit, more fruit. Um, but you want the leaves to be off before they bloom. And if we had the ideal weather here, they bloom in April. We don't have the ideal weather here, so they usually bloom May, June, July. But um, encourage them by stripping leaves off by April, say, end of March, early April. Questions today. Do, do they like to have like the leaves around the base of the tree like other? We assume all trees want their dead leaves below them. That that nature did that for a reason. Yes, so, I I was adding that. But but if, if you take the leaves off, it'd be good to put them right there. Okay. I just, just want to confirm what I Yes. Yeah, we always, in my yard, same thing. We always try to pop the leaves right into the tree. I mean, that tree dropped those leaves below it for a reason. Uh, there's supposed to be an average of five inches of dead leaves underneath trees, and they sometimes a lot deeper than that. So to create a balance point, because they always say don't leave things on the grounds, the trees goes to the next year, is that not a concern? Mm -hmm. Don't think so. I mean, like on roses, they said that you don't have to clean up the dead leaves on the ground on roses. Copy. They said the disease is, by the time the leaves on the ground, the diseases are pretty much dead too. So the disease, they're more active while the leaves are attached to the plants. Rust, you know, roses, rusty black spot. Actually, pears and apples can get something very similar to black spot. We don't usually get it here. Because pears and apples, most pears and apples leaf out May, June, July, and it's not raining. Uh, I mean, it, you know, back when we had some El Ninos, some my pear trees developed bad spotting on the leaves that also transferred to the fruit. Uh, um, because, you know, some El Nino years, we had rain in June. So the leaves were out, they were getting disease, the disease was splashing on through. We had some problems with the fruit too. And we saw that on, on the Anna apple. Anna, uh, 1994, we had an El Nino that year, 1995. And the Anna had leaked out in February and March and it kept raining. And then they had what looked like black spot on the leaves and it transferred to the fruit. Uh, just so you know, that's called, um, apple scab. And garden frost controls that too. So, in, just in case that happens, you get leaves and then you get rain on the leaves. Uh, this stops the apple scab as well as fire. Um, you have to spray the foliage, but different, different structures involved. The same thing on pears. If, if we get rain late, uh, they can get a similar disease on the pears, leaves, and fruit. So I have a two-year-old pear and a two-year-old uh, uh, fried peach. Right? 
So he's pretty big in the past two after two years when I moved to him. Yeah, pears and apples are both very resistant to damage. So they're the, you know, if you're gonna move a plant, you move an apple tree, you should make it. Move a pear tree, you should make it. They they heal their wounds really well. Whereas I would not recommend ever moving a peach to probably kill in the process. Yeah, the pear produce the peach for sure. I got to cut the peach back. Well, they'll produce better if they're not being shaded. Well, if you train them with the tiered style or on a fence line, I mean, seven foot apart. Seven foot. Between trunks. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's interesting. At my first house, when I was single, uh, I planted all my, my backyard was one fruit tree every seven foot. For some reason, I came up with that number in my head, you know, 40 years ago. I said, and the books all said 20 foot apart. And I just, but I wanted variety. So I just put them seven feet apart and I had fruit on most of my trees. And now they're telling the orchard seven foot, but train them. You know, in those days, I didn't know how to train my tree. We just let them grow this style, the base shape, because that's what we were told. But now we're knowing that it's better to train the branches flat out. So they'll produce at that small size. So, uh, but yeah, seven foot apart is what they're doing in the orchards. You have to plant more trees, um, but you'll get more fruit production and more different, you can fit more different varieties. So if I plant them less than seven foot, for example, what would happen? Well, you, well the, okay, so if you go on Dave Wilson's website, they have different ways for planting fruit trees. So they'll tell you, you can make a head of fruit different every three feet. As long as you do a single row or, you know, you can zigzag your row a bit, but three foot, you can make a head and all be crushed together like this. The only fruit on the sides where the sun can hit, of course. So you can't get fruit on the sides that are touching each other like that. But it'll still fruit. Mm -hmm. So they claim four foot high, three foot apart, and closest they would recommend doing it. Now, I I did this, and I thought, that's just too close. I'd rather go four feet, mm -hmm. minimum four feet between trunks that has three foot. They're really growing into each other. It's really, mm -hmm. really hard to keep them separate, so I go four feet. Mm -hmm. But, um, Five but feet would be good though, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the further you go, the better it is. And they said the other way you can do this, so you don't have to do so much training, is from up above, use plants up to five trees in a circle and let them form one big tree with each one of these trees taking a part of that structure. And this way they're less apt, you know, they don't like crisscrossing and the trees don't like crossing branches. Because I did this on quite a few trees in my yard, apples, peaches, plums, and you put them in a circle like this, most of the branchings grow outwards. They don't grow, very few branches crisscross because they don't want, it's too dark in here already. So they grow outwards, and because you're going to pretty much, pretty good size here, eight foot across, eight foot, ten foot across, then it's, it's not as hard to train them because they're growing bigger, but they're controlling each other. You know, each each tree is acting like one branch on this large tree. So that's another way to do it. How far? Uh, they said six, 18 inches. Hmm. So I had a peach group like this and I got but still, if I had a new choice to do it now, I'd probably plant them because this is harder to work on than a single tree every, every, you know, yeah. every right. seven feet. It's the Well, you don't have to do anything. I mean, if you plant plants in the ground, there's the fungus that's already there. 
And in ecosystems, they're saying now that the mycorrhizal fungus that's in the ground is the king of the neighborhood. It, it rules everything. So most plants we know with, that we grow, except for grass crops, uh, most plants we know are connected to this fungus that lives in the ground. So they say up in Oregon, there's one fungus that connects to hundreds of trees. It connects hundreds of tree roots are all joined to this one fungus organism in the ground called the mycorrhizal fungus. The mycorrhizal fungus is the organism that takes, that comes up out of the ground and consumes the dead leaves. And it takes nutrients and gives it back to the tree in, uh, in um, so it's a symbiotic relationship. The tree gives the for the nutrients that the fungus gives them, the mineral nutrients, the tree gives them sugar. So, you know, plant bodies and, and fungus bodies are made out of cellulose, which is sugar. And then the fungus eats the dead leaves on top of the ground and gives the nutrients back to the trees. And one fungus can connect to hundreds of plants in your garden. So once that connection is made, the plants start sharing the nutrients in the water. So you can water one tree, the next tree gets the water. That may take a few years for that to happen, but uh, uh, it will happen. I mean, uh, my anecdotal evidence is I, my first house, I bought a 20 year old house, and I noticed that only about one out of every four sprinkler heads was working. I go, well, how are these plants staying green? <laughs> You know, this area is all dry. How how are these plants staying green? And yeah, it was a twenty year old yard. So, and when I dug, you know, I dug up one of the trees in the front yard because it was getting to my sewer line. Twenty year old maple tree, hundred foot of roots. My roots grow big too. But again, uh, the mycorrhizal fungus does connect um, the whole garden together, so that they're all sharing. After a while, they all share. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.